I started my career as a software developer. Um, and the introduction I'll give that maybe some of you heard, have heard before, I'm an art school dropout. If you're an art school dropout and you become a software developer, that makes you a UI person. <laughs> if you're a UI person and you're somewhat comfortable talking with customers, well, in a product organization, that'll eventually escalate you to product manager. And I spent a lot of time working directly with customers. So throughout the 90s, well, what drove my passion is well, frankly, delivering a lot of crappy stuff through the 90s, and what began to make me passionate is figuring out that I could make it better, figuring out that I could win, figuring out that I could develop things that really made a difference for the people that I worked with. So as a former developer, well, as a former product manager, I find that I want everything, and as a former developer, I find I'm bad at estimating, and so this talk uh, is a, well, what you're going to get is a talk that isn't going to fit very well in 30 minutes. So let's dig in here. I've got a few key messages. If I put them all up front here, then I can say at least I said them once. Look, I want to talk about this foundational thing. And we're going to be talking about stories, and I'm known for this thing called story mapping. But really, I've got to drop back to one of the things that's going horribly wrong in, in well, with stories and with process in general that we tend to share a lot of documents and believe that we're sharing information. And look, I want you to start to look at what real storytelling looks like. And it takes a lot more than words uh, just to tell a story. And stories are not about what we're building. They're, they're about a lot more than that. And then finally, Look, uh, one of the things that's happened, especially in agile development, is we start to focus on these stories and these backlogs, and we start to focus on building little bits of things. And, well, we need to start to focus on the whole story. So let's talk about that document thing. Now, if anybody's heard me talk before, well, you, you know I use some examples. There's a website my wife sent me to a long time ago called cakerex.com. Um, now, you need to imagine, if you will, a conversation of somebody ordering a cake uh, and dial up the phone and say, look, I, I'd, like, I'd like a cake. Yeah, great, what would you like on it? Can you write on it, so long Alicia in purple with stars around it? <laughs> and this gets written down and passed on to someone who's a decorator, and this is exactly what we get. Now, if you haven't visited cakerex.com, it started as an interesting, fun website. It started by someone who would put up oddly decorated cakes, and, and she's a great writer. She'll describe those things. Um, it grew and grew. This is the cover of the first book that she put out. Uh, she's got a couple books out now. I like them a lot because they were really nice about sharing their pictures with me, letting me use them in my book. Uh, but if you look at the cover, this is an example. Well, they've got a lot of different kinds of wrecks, but one of them are what they call literals. One of them is where what gets put on the cake is precisely what gets written down. Uh, people interpret their instructions literally. Now, can everybody see what went wrong with that? Okay, uh, uh, some of the things are straightforward. Um, I think this is how you say no, you can't have sprinkles. And uh, this is the non-functional requirement. And then, well, finally you get to a point where you think that just that people aren't listening. Look, if, if people had just talked to each other, and maybe if they were paying attention, they, uh, silly things like that wouldn't happen. Now, these are funny because we're talking about a $20 cake, or maybe more sometimes, but there are a lot less funny examples. I'll cite this one, but hey, if we dug around for a while, we could find a lot of others. This dates back to 99. This is a, you well, know, NASA launched the Mars Orbiter. This was part of an initiative to do a lot more space exploration at a lot lower cost. They launched the orbiter, it went all the way to Mars, and instead of orbiting Mars, it was called an orbiter, it was supposed to do that, it 
Well, it's still not clear exactly what happened. Uh, it might have crashed directly into Mars, it might have flew past Mars, but it, it didn't go into orbit around Mars. And it came down to a couple different groups that were working on ground control software and managing how this thing worked. And, well, one group, well, these two groups wrote software, and one was exchanging values in metric units, in Newtons, I believe, and one was exchanging them in, uh, I believe it was pounds of torque, but, uh, one was exchanging them in imperial units, and they'd been exchanging values for a long time, and nobody had detected it, and they talk about sending software back and forth to each other via email, but no one really talking. And this stuff is well documented. Everybody could point to where it was documented, and, and people started to point to layering on more process to have other people read the documents to the people who were supposed to read the documents in the first place. But now the basic idea here is that documents don't work very well. The, the idea is that if I read a document, I can form a picture in my head, and if three different people read a document, we can each form a fairly different picture in our head. Well, that guy is Kent Beck, and my exposure to agile development, in particular extreme programming, came from working at a startup here in San Francisco in 2000 and 2001. The, the company I worked for had hired this guy, Kent, who had just put out this new book called Extreme Programming Explained. And Kent was describing this thing called a story. And well, his disruptively simple idea to handling documents was well, to just stop it. Look, stop exchanging documents and tell me your story. I want to go back through that because I want that quote. The, the, basic idea is if we could just talk with each other, a lot of these mistakes wouldn't happen. We build a better understanding of what we're going to build. And the idea was disruptively simple. The idea is, look, if I'm a user, if I'm someone who understands what to build, write it down on a card and write a bunch of these things. And it really doesn't matter what you write on the card because we are going to get together and have a conversation. And while you're describing uh, while you're describing what it is you're thinking of, I'm going to be learning and understanding, and I'm going to be thinking about what it is we could build. Now, in 99 and 2000, 2001, 2000, 2001, when I started using this stuff, I kind of hated that term story. It sounded weird to trivialize the important stuff we were building as the stories our people would tell us. I, I just didn't quite get the, the name. Uh, but th these days, well, you saw Mary uh, describe uh, not Spotify's rules. They talk about a backlog and a story. It's, stories have entered kind of common vernacular these days. And as people started to grab onto stories, we started getting more process around them, process more sophisticated than that. Now, one of the first stabs at process uh, were these, uh, these three C's. This, this comes from... Um, comes from Ron Jeffries, and he described, look, if, if there's a process for working with stories. It starts with writing a card, and the card might describe what you envision, and then we carry that card into a conversation. In that conversation, I can explain it to you. You'll get a picture of what it is that I'm thinking of, and it might be wrong, but because it's a conversation, we can ask questions. We can have a real conversation. And, uh, well, what we're driving towards is some agreement on what we're going to build, this confirmation thing. Now, we may use a lot of things in that conversation. It, it, it's not just about the conversation. It's, oh, well, we, have, we might use workflow models or use cases or personas or other types of models, but we eventually agree on the short answer to the question, what will we check to determine if this thing is done? Now, things go wrong when you start uh, wrapping things in process, but I want to make one key point before I move on here that stories get their name from how they're supposed to be used, not how they're supposed to be written. Kent gave them the term stories because we're supposed to get together and tell our stories. And if I hear one more time somebody ask me the question, how do I write good stories, I will scream uh, because <laughs> the point isn't writing good stories, the point is that conversation. Now, we started with that simple idea, but we still managed to start to screw that up. This is a, you know, I dug through my pictures last night, and I don't want to victimize anyone 
client or group I've worked with unfairly. I was gonna blank out their eyes. You couldn't tell who they were, but uh, this is a backlog grooming session. Now, the, who, in the room, are you, who in the room are using an agile process and using stories here? But is anybody set through a backlog grooming session that looks a little like this? Yeah. Yeah, so usually you get this uh, JIRA or some other tracking system projected on the wall and we are going to put those stories up and we are going to focus on that confirmation. We are going to talk about the acceptance criteria for the story. Now, uh, the person in the back, uh, I'll call her Lily, because that's her name, and she's, uh, she's writing some things and everyone is kind of ignoring her a little bit. Uh, uh, about three of the people are actively engaged in this conversation, and uh, this guy's really secretly reading his email on his smartphone. They ban computers, but that doesn't stop them from doing other things at the table. And look, that guy's not raising his hand to speak. He's yawning. Uh, a lot of pictures of people doing this. So if you look how far those guys are leaning back on their chairs, if those chairs weren't built for safety, they would have fallen over a long time ago. This is not the kind of conversation that Kent had in mind when he talked about telling stories. I'm seeing a rash of these really not so effective conversations. So when the conversation is working, something special is going on here. I'll use this series of slides a lot, and uh, it, well, it's the idea that we may talk about something, we may read something, and we form different pictures in our head, and we may even say we agree. We agree on those acceptance criteria, we agree on those requirements, we agree on whatever, but it's when we externalize our thinking, it's when we take things out of our head and move them around and start to make sense of them that we realize, no, I'm thinking of something different. I keep getting reminded of this. I got reminded of this multiple times last week working with teams. As I saw multiple people, including me, thinking we had it, and then we did a little bit more to make what we're talking about visible, and it kind of fell apart. We were thinking very different things. In this situation, it's not that I'm right or you're right. Uh, it's that we all have a bit of, we all have a piece of the puzzle. It's when we start to combine and refine that we put them back together and we end up with something better. And it's when we leave these kinds of conversations that we may still say the same words, we may still say the same feature. In the case of the group I was working with last week, we're trying to figure out how to facilitate a game for a large uh, conference. But now we may still refer to the same game, but now we have the same picture in our head. It's this state of shared understanding that we're going for. And when the conversation is working well, that's what we get. Look, it does not look like those guys sitting at the conference room typing acceptance criteria into JIRA. It looks a lot more like someone telling stories, and you can tell when somebody's telling a story because they'll wave their hands around a lot. And them describing something, and we're watching for this intangible quality of well, we feel we're on the same page here. We get it. It looks a lot more like this. This is a picture from the lane took a long time ago that I keep leaning on. Uh, it, it looks like this. These people are talking through a bunch of things. Oh my gosh, well, you recognize that theme. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, it looks a lot more like this when people are showing words and pictures and using those to mark what they're doing, it looks a lot more like this. When we're telling stories that are working and really externalizing our thinking, it's a lot more intense. It's a lot more than acceptance criteria criteria in a ticket system. So speaking of ticket systems and speaking of JIRA, uh, JIRA is made by a company called Atlassian, and Atlassian is one of the bigger tool vendors out there. They make JIRA and Confluence. One of the interesting things for me is when I, uh, I'll stop in at the Sydney office of Atlassian whenever I'm in Australia, which is starting to be a couple times a year. And, but when I stop in any other Agile shop, I will see lots of stuff on the wall uh, when things are going right. Well, but one of the things I commonly see on the wall at other companies are things like task boards and Kanban boards and things that show status. 
When I walk into Atlassian, of course I'm not gonna see that. They write JIRA, they use JIRA as their ticketing system. Their task boards are there, but it doesn't mean they don't use their walls. It means every team has a wall like this and they are absolutely covered with things. The stuff their walls are covered with, that guy's Sharif, he's one of the main product managers of Confluence, and this is a little bit after hours, we're kind of walking around and just looking, and what you'll see on that wall are simple personas, our screenshots, are the results of people drawing together and thinking through this stuff. I can go to team area after team area and look at what people are doing, and they're, they're making their thinking visible about the product they're building. They're really telling stories. Uh, I got there later in the day, and this is a team driving towards a release of JIRA specifically, and at the end of every day, they're gonna huddle around this wall. On that wall is the flow of, of the features they've been working on, and they'll talk about this, they'll annotate it, they'll say, this is still bumpy, this is a problem, this is good. And out of that daily meeting, at the end of every day, they'll make notes and they'll put tickets into JIRA for things to fix in the morning. These people are engaged in looking at the whole picture all the time. It's these visualizations we create that have the quality of a vacation photo. Now, I mean, I, I had to pull up one of my vacation photos. Look, those are my two daughters on a, on a beach in Hawaii. And if I were to share my vacation photos with you, you might politely say, hey, they're cute, that looks like fun. But when I look at that particular picture, I remember that particular beach in Hawaii. Well, we'd been on this vacation and every beach we went to was freaking crowded. Uh, it was uh, on the big island of Hawaii and all the beaches were really rocky. We had learned about this particular beach, but it was kind of hard to get to and hard to get to translated to over an hour drive over a four wheel drive trail in a rental car that was bottoming out as we went over things and I'm stressed about how much damage I'm gonna to have to pay in this car. And then when we get there, we have another half hour hike over lava rock. Now, if you've got kids, you know that they're not saying this is great. They're, they're, they're saying nothing could be worth this. They're complaining the whole way. But when we get there, this beach is incredible. Hardly anybody is there. I wonder why. Uh, and, you know, you usually go snorkeling and you hope to see a turtle, but on this particular beach you had to be careful where you walked because they were up on the beach just uh, warming themselves. And you could see tons of them out snorkeling and uh, it was just a terrific beach. And I remember all that when I see the picture because I was there and you weren't. And when those people at Atlassian are looking at the board and they see some simple screenshots, and a few sticky notes with a few words written on them, there's a lot more that they remember and a lot more information that they get because they were there and you weren't. That's good documentation. And it isn't thorough, it isn't detailed, and it is definitely not meant to stand alone. It's meant to stand together with storytelling. Look, what I see go wrong is people actually doing this, working together and building that sense of shared understanding. And the, the, what goes wrong starts to happen in the handoff. And when the handoff goes well, I hand that off and I hand it by sharing the story of me and you sit together and I retell the story. And the important thing is the person who gets to work writing that code has the same well, picture in their head as I did when I started. But where things go horribly wrong, and I see this pretty commonly is we agree on the story, the acceptance criteria, we write it all down in a ticketing system, and we hand that off to someone else. And we right away move from story-driven thinking to document-driven thinking. It's a story that we're trying to tell here. If I go back here, it, where I finally started to rock user stories is, well, actually, let's, let's come to this. That, I want to make the point that effective story conversations are about building a state of shared understanding. It's intangible. We have to feel it. We can't necessarily see it. We can't ask to, to sign off on it. The, the best documents use words and pictures to help us recall the conversations. They don't replace the conversations. Now, if we get storytelling right and start to do it that way, um, well, things get, can still well, they still get screwed up. Now, I've got to switch over to a KREX example one more time. A lot of the KREX examples are those literals, 
Uh, this is a different one. This is a cake for a baby shower. It's a little creepy. Uh, <laughs> kind of looks a little creepy, but it's a cake. Uh, and, uh, we can all agree that's a pretty well decorated cake. It really looks like a lifelike looking baby. Now, I could describe that to someone, and someone could decorate that cake, and people could say, well, that's, they've done a great job on that cake. But the problem comes later. Uh, the, the problem comes when you present that in the shower, and it's time to cut that cake. And, that's, uh, and it's when you start to think through not just how it looks, but who's using it and how it's going to be used that things go really. So that's the conversation we need to have. I went back and had a conversation with Kent, uh, uh, you know, back and forth through email eventually, and I said, look, something's gone horribly wrong, Kent, with this whole story thing. I finally get it now, Kent, that you meant that the stories are not, I mean, we're not referring to our customers' things clearly as their story. They really are the important stuff they want. You're referring to how we should use them. I finally get it now, Kent. And I said, well, where did, how did this go wrong? Well, well, I started asking, where did you get the idea? And he said, well, what I was thinking of was the way users sometimes tell stories about the cool new things their software does. I, I type in a zip code, and it automatically fills in the city, state, and zip. I think that was the example that triggered the idea. If you can tell stories about this, what the software does and generate energy, interest, and vision in your listener's mind, then why not tell the story before it does it? Now, if you listen closely, what Kent is talking about here is not what we're building, not only what we're building. We're talking about who and why. We're talking about how things are going to be used. Uh, it's the outcome that we're talking about, not just the output, the stuff that we're building. Now, things started going wrong with stories very early on. This is my friend, Rachel. Can you say hi, Rachel? Good, perfect. I'm going to go fast forward, we just have a few more minutes here. Look, Rachel works for a company called Connextra, and they early on uh, ran into this problem where people weren't, it's funny, she wrote writing good stories. Uh, she came up, their company came up with this template, the as a type of user I want, so that, and she, they, put this card together to show an XP day in 2001 to, to show off their cool new idea. And the, the idea was, well, what's written there as the description, not the title, it's important to, if, boy, if I'm gonna blow my top the next time I see somebody's backlog filled with stories that start with as a user I want. Uh, notice that one has a title, and if we're gonna talk about these in uh, Look, you've got a choice when you're talking about them, and you can refer to its title, or you can re refer to its Jira ticket number. Uh, but the description is that conversation starter. It's uh, the way for the person to start the conversation by, oh, I can read that, and now the conversation starts. It sort of sets the stage, make sure that we're talking about who, what, and why. Now, look, I want to fast forward just a little bit here, but we want to make sure that we focus on that collaboration around, uh, around who, what, and why, and talk about what's going to happen later after we deliver this. Remember, I think Marty said this morning that it's, if you're focusing on the release, you're focusing on the wrong thing. The real action starts after, and the discussion should be about that. Um, now, even if we get those things right, even if we have these rich conversations, even if we really talk about the who, what, and why, one of the things that's been troubling to me over the past little while is, well, I remember when we first started using stories back in 2000, 2001, stories were fairly big things. They were the stuff the team worked on together. Uh, well, a team might take on two or three stories, and well, they might take several people many, many days or weeks to finish. But now it's ideal that stories are small things, something that an individual developer can finish up in a couple days. And we've started to really lose the forest for the trees. Now, I saw this very early on, saw the advantages of creating little things, but it was important for me to keep track of the whole story, the big picture. I've got to talk about this story mapping thing. Now, look, a story map is a stupid, simple idea. I'm, I'm the one that coined the term. 
but I found lots of people doing the same type of thing, and it's pretty straightforward. If I were to tell a story about what people are doing, and I will were to give the steps one after another, and then we were to start talking about the details of every step, so we end up getting this square map, something that looks a lot like this. Now, I gotta tell this story about Gary, and this is a, well, Gary was using an agile process. Uh, Gary uh, was founding a startup, and he has this idea for a, a great new product. And he calls somebody up that's fairly reputable, very reputable, and says, look, I want to build a product. They say, look, we're going to use an agile approach. All you need to do is write down all the things that you want, put them in a backlog and prioritize them, and we'll do the highest priority stuff first. And well, Gary says, it's cool, sounds great. He starts doing that, and months go by. And for Gary, when months go by, since he's a founder of a startup, it means dollars are being burned. And the product isn't taking shape, and he's starting to complain. And uh, well, the, the guy at the the guy that was building his software that ran the business said, "Jeff, can you go out and talk to Gary?" And well, I showed up one day, and we had this conversation. Now it started by talking about Gary. What is the big idea here? What's this product? Why are you building it? What, what, what benefit do you hope to get? We, have a discussion to frame it, and we keep externalizing our thinking as we go. We go a little bit deeper into who the users are. Well, and it's not just one kind of user, it's different types, and we talk about why they would use it. And then we start telling a story. We say, well, it's great, great, let's figure out who's doing what when, and let's tell a story one step after another, and we get a long workflow. Sometimes when Gary gets to a key part in the workflow, it, he gets excited and we go into a bunch more details. We kind of try and push forward and get to the end of the story and then come back and fill in the details. Now, all those details, all those white cards, yeah, those turn out to be things that we could give the developers to build, but it's seeing those things in context, seeing those things in the whole story that really tells us the, the big who, what, and why, the, the whole story for the whole product. Hey, uh, this just in. Uh, <coughs> Gary got this business started. It was called Mad Mimi, and it was actually just a, a couple weeks ago that uh, Gary he sold out, man. Uh, uh, GoDaddy bought his company. Uh, and I don't know how much he won't say, but there's at least seven zeros after the number. And so I've worked with a lot of startups, but not many succeed. But Gary stuck to his gun, stuck, stuck to his gun, stuck to his vision, and the, the product turned out to be pretty darn good. I want to show one more example of this story mapping thing, and uh, since we're at the edge, we're just past the edge. I like this video because it shows this thing working from beginning to end. These people are really telling stories. This is a team, Globo.com is the largest media company in Brazil. This is a team rethinking the, through one of their properties, a product called Baixa Tudo. It's Portuguese for download it all. They're imagining a new product. That row of green cards comes from them telling the story. If they imagine this, the, the, if they take their vision for the new product, or actually it's a rework of an existing product, they tell that long story in green cards, and then they start to go both up and down. Long story's long, so they start adding pink cards at the top to sort of summarize it, to distill it, to give that story a better backbone. And then they start going a little bit deeper. They're looking at the existing site and they're kind of whinging about what doesn't work about that site and uh, what, the, what the problems are with it. And they use that as fodder for imagining a better experience. People ask me, what's the difference between those bright green cards and the other green cards? Uh, there's no difference, they just ran out of the other cards. But if you watch those bright green cards, you'll start to see more and more of them appear as they go. It's because they keep telling and retelling and rethinking the whole story. And you'll notice this thing starts to fatten up quite a bit. Now we've got the whole storyline. We've got it summarized in pink cards. We've dropped down into lots of details. The story starts to stabilize a little bit, but this talking, this is just words. It's just telling what people do. It's got a shape that helps us tell the story, but they've got to move forward into pictures. Look, if it says there that I want to be able to choose from the, the, the hottest downloads today, what does that look like on the screen? These are UX people and developers working together. Uh, 
the UX person originally asked the developer, can you get some images out of the database? And the developer says, no, let me, I can get them out for you and format them in XHTML. And they put together these nice snippets and they start paper prototyping their way through this thing. This is what we mean by storytelling. Now, let me roll this thing up here. That, look, story maps are how you understand your whole product or features experience. Uh, using mapping to break down that big story, to move from little to big. I summarize everything here. That, look, you need to be telling stories, not just writing them. Visualize what you're doing. Don't just agree on acceptance criteria. Build shared understanding of what it is we're building. Tell that whole story and use a technique like mapping. Use any technique you want, but don't just build things one little piece at a time. And then here's the, here's the big point, that if stories are working right, we're connecting every day back to why we're building what we're building, back to the purpose that I heard mentioned over and over, both by Marty and Mary. And with that, and three minutes over, I'm going to end this thing. Thanks very much uh, for sitting through. And while we're changing over, I'm happy to answer any questions that you want to get